the window you want to record. That message was not coming earlier. It's recording. No, how do we know that? In which window is it recording? Because I, it asked me to click the window you want to record. So anyway, so as a backup, I'll do the audio as well. All right, okay. So has the book trader launched? Yeah. So the, the last thing we looked at, I think is, uh, I think at the back, you guys can't see it. Can you guys see it at the back? You can still see the whole thing? Okay. So the last thing we looked at here is, the bid price, you can look at the ask size and here the bid size. All right. So anyway, you can see this. So what are the expression we used for the, uh, just a couple of more terms I want to introduce. So the highest bid and the highest offer in terms of a, uh, of a trading, uh, of an order book, what is it called? The highest bid and highest offer, when you can only see the highest bid and the highest offer, sorry, not highest offer, the highest bid and the uh, lowest offer. When you're only seeing those two prices uh, with reference to a trade, uh, an order book, this is an order book, okay? Here you can see the Euro order book, okay? Uh, so here in, in the context of that, what is that uh, expression that we discussed? The highest bid and the lowest offer, what are, what are they called? How are they referred to? Everyone has forgotten? That's called the top of the book, right? So that is distinguished from the market depth. Okay, if you want to see the full market depth, that means you want to see the full order book, the rest of it. If you can only see those two prices, highest bid and lowest offer, that's called the top of the book. But the book right here is referring to the order book. This is the order book in the Euro as it exists on this PWS software. So these orders are entered by market makers and also uh, various investors who want to, who have an interest on one side of the market. Somebody who wants to buy at a particular price will put in a left, this 19 and a half million guy. This 1584 half, he wants to buy 19 and a half million. So he's put in that order. Okay, so you can also put in one sided orders in a, in a software like this. Okay, so is everyone clear about this so far? Okay, so now uh, the other two terms that I wanted to also uh, want to just introduce this view. You can see how fast these prices are changing, right? Can you see how fast the prices are changing? And this is actually quite a liquid, uh, quite a, if you go back to uh, where we are right now in terms of time. Sorry. Where we are right now is okay. If you look at this time now, if you just this gives you a sense of the foreign exchange uh, market, uh, how they open and close. You can see the Sydney closes. Uh, Sydney opens earlier. They haven't mentioned Wellington because it's a smaller center. So you can see that Sydney and Tokyo are open right now, and these are all closed. So London is closed. It will open in one hour. New York will open much later. Okay, so this is the state of the market and Sydney has already closed now. See that bar has gone black. So right now it's only Tokyo and Singapore and Hong Kong which are open right now. That's why you see that the activity on this order book is not that frantic. If you remember yesterday, the last class that we had, in the last class we were holding it a little bit later, right? So London was open so the activity was much more frantic. So here it's not changing that frequently. So more the activity, more the price changing, changing, fluctuation. Not necessary always. So what Tanuj is asking is, if, the, if there is greater activity, does that always mean that there will be great, greater fluctuation in price? That is not necessary uh, at all times. Because you could have high levels of activity without much movement in the price. If it is balanced on both sides. Buying and selling is more in the limited market. Also than no, buying and selling is more or less balanced. Okay, if there is not, if there is more or less balance between the buyers and the sellers, you could have very high volumes of trading with not much movement in the price. Is everyone clear about this? That is not necessary for the price to move. If you have, you can have very high volumes. That's why that is an ideal situation for a market maker, right? That you don't have, you have very high volumes with not, not a lot of dramatic movement in the price. That is because the buyers and sellers are more or less evenly balanced. And the market makers also have reasonably squared books, so they don't have any bias towards one side. Okay, they don't have a position to square or something, so the price doesn't move much. Is this clear? Okay, it is not necessary. Okay, so uh, so the other two terms. Uh, so and uh, so the, the I, I wanted to just introduce a couple of other terms. So what will happen is if you have uh, well, this point, we remember we discussed high frequency trading, yes, HFT. Okay. So we discuss HFT, so in future I'm just going to say HFT to refer to high frequency trading. So this gives you a, because the prices here are changing even though it's not, London is not yet open. 
So even then, the prices are changing quite frequently. Okay, so you can see this is basically this will give you a feel of what high frequency trading is. Okay, this is what people do. They I don't know why this because the price has gone. The price is moving up. Okay, so we can keep it here. Then at least the people at the back can see. Yeah. So what high frequency traders do is essentially this and you can or notice one more thing you notice how uh, what is happening is see how small the price increments are can you see that 90 to 90, that fifth decimal fifth decimal is changing by five okay in the bid and the offer so you see how actually the price is moving up that's why this view is moving up you can also see from here you get a sense of how the price is behaving the price is moving up that's why if you go to a a uh, view like this this price is moving up that's why if you see this this is what you're seeing actually happening on this court board that price is moving up okay so the one thing that you notice is that I have to keep moving this to keep the view of the best bid and offer okay so you notice that the price increments are very small, right? You notice that and it's changing quite frequently, the price increments are very small. So this gives you a sense of what HFT is. HFT involves trading in very large volumes, okay, for very small price movements. Okay, if you have a very large volume, then you can make money even with small price moves. So you are trying to basically manipulate these, uh, you try to strategically place your bids and offers in such a way that you will get executed on the preferred side, okay? Or sometimes you may, uh, you know, take. Sometimes you may function as a price taker, but mostly HFT people are functioning as market makers, okay? They are trying to essentially, uh, you know, they try to put in both sides, okay? Uh, most of the time, sometimes they may put in one side, and they are essentially trying to capture very small price movements with very large volume. Yeah, and you can see that is possible because you can see how much fluctuation there is in a short period of time. Now again, the price is falling back. Okay, so this is what I just wanted to give you a feel through this. I wanted to give you a feel of what is involved in HFT. And obviously, that kind of thing you have to do in an algorithmic way because you cannot do this at this speed manually. By the time you enter, the price would have moved. It has to be done through computers. Okay. So okay. So the first thing is I just wanted to give you a feel of HFT. And a couple of new terms that we want to introduce, uh, which, which you should be aware of, which is there's an expression called spoofing. Okay, spoofing is a term that we use in finance, especially in the context of uh, HFT. The spoofing is S P W O F. Okay, I put it into your notes so that you can. Okay, I've put in these in. I've also given you a CNBC article that you can read to understand the uh, definition of spoofing and layering. So there are two terms that you should be familiar with, spoofing and layering, and they appear mainly in the context of HFT. So what happens in the case of spoofing is, see, most of these orders we would assume these are genuine orders, like you just saw that 18, 10 million, 11 million, and 15, 80 is changing so fast that uh, whatever the prices that you are seeing, okay, then there's a size next to that. So these are supposed to be assumed to be genuine orders, okay? That is, people actually want to buy and sell at these prices, all right? But sometimes in the case of spoofing, what happens is these are people who want to deceive the market. So what they want to do is, typically if you are a spoofer, what you will do is you will put in a very large order. If you want the price to go down, okay? Just think about this from a deception point of view and a strategy point of view. What you are trying to do is you want the price to actually go down. So if I want the price to go down, I want to scare the people in the market. What I am going to do is, the, if the price now is 1577 half, okay? I will put a price at 1578, okay? I will put it for maybe $2 billion. Because the prices here are small, okay, 3 million, 4 million, 10. I'll put it for, you know, $2 billion. I'll put in a sell order at 15, just above where the market is, I'll put in a sell order at $2 billion. Because I want to scare people, showing them that, creating the impression that there's $2 billion worth of sell orders at 1578. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay, you're trying to scare people, everybody's looking at this, okay? Everyone is looking at this, especially the HFT players are looking at this. Yeah. Sorry? The volume is coming outside very far. Okay, then reduce it a little bit. Okay, so, uh, so, so what are, is everyone clear about this? That you want to deceive the market, you want to create a deception, an effect of deception, okay? So you you scare the market by showing that there is a very high, uh, high volume sell order just very close to the market, 
just above the market. Is this clear? Okay. So this is, but basically you don't have your actual intention is for the price to go down by just by scaring people. You have no intention of actually selling at 1578. You don't want to sell two billion dollars. You have no intention of executing that order. You are just putting in that order to scare the market. Okay. And then your intention is when the market actually goes down, you will cancel the order. Okay. That's basically the idea behind spoofing. The spoofing essentially is entering orders without having any intention of executing them. Okay. Basically, to play this game because everyone is looking at the standard display and trying to see how the price uh, volume combination is moving. So you try to scare the market by putting in orders which you have no intention of executing. So later on, you will pull them back okay, before execution. And then you are hoping that by putting that kind of a large sell order, you are going to scare the market and push it down. And actually, you are looking to buy at lower prices. Okay. So this is part one of the problems. So this is there's an Indian guy called uh, where the British citizen. Uh, there's a guy called Narendra Sarao, we can read about it, it's mentioned in the CNBC article as well. He was actually uh, arrested and I think he's now been extradited to the US. The US uh, CFTC okay, actually uh, prosecuted him for uh, engaging in spoofing you know, on the S&P uh, futures contracts. Okay? He was sitting at his home in, in the UK and through his software and through his algorithms, he was actually trying to manipulate the E-mini S&P futures market. Okay. Same thing, any kind of, it's a form of market manipulation where you are deceiving people, you are showing them large orders and you have no intention of, yeah. spoofing is illegal, under US law spoofing is illegal, so uh, most jurisdictions will, will try to make it illegal, so spoofing is one term that you need to be aware of in the context of what all is going on in the modern markets, okay, uh, and, uh, and the other term is of course related to spoofing, if you do spoofing at multiple price levels, that's called layering, layering means you are putting on multiple layers, right, like in a black forest cake, you have layers, the strawberry, the chocolate, this, that, right? So layers. So layering is just another, it's a uh, more advanced form of spoofing where you are spoofing at multiple levels. You are putting in false orders at, uh, at multiple levels for multiple large volumes and you have no intention of executing any of them. Is this clear? Okay, so these are just two terms that you can put limit orders. Yeah, these are all limit orders. These are all limit orders. Because if you put a market order, it will get executed. Okay, so it will get executed. You are always doing this through limit orders. Okay. In fact, all of these are limit orders. All of this that you see, these are all limit orders. They are being placed and then as the execution happens, then uh, the price moves. Okay. So these are all limit orders actually. Okay. So uh, that takes care of this. Now we have to move on quickly to the yeah, that's what we were seeing. See, this price has dropped now. That's what you saw going on there in the in the display board as well. So you can try to correlate these as well. Okay. All right. Now what we have to do is we have to quickly move and get you started on your case because we don't have a lot of time. This. I want to give you at least five weeks. I think we'll be able to give you five weeks if we give you two weeks of uh, practice. Sir, when you download the OIDA software for the desktop, we get the two icons. So in which one you have to so when Practice. You have to go for practice. One minute. Is there a confusion here? See, this is desktop live. This is desktop live. This is not what you should be using. You should be using desktop practice. Can you see this? Okay, so you got to go for desktop practice because yours is a practice account. Okay, so for now, since the problems still exist on the IBGWS, the data problems, we are going to try and uh, we are going to get ready to do the project on Wanda itself. All right, and then if the IB works out, then we'll see about what we want to do later on. Okay, so let's first quickly understand the case so that we can get you started with what has what is required. I can close the book trader now. It's taking up. All right. Okay, guys. This is the case. How many of you have read the case? How many of you have read it? Only very few. Okay. All right. Okay. So and uh, and you've uh, looked at the first three questions. Okay. So let's just go through quickly uh, and make sure that you understand because you need to start practicing, and we have to go through this. Uh, so this is a different kind of case. You're familiar with uh, your normal cases. This is a different kind of case because it's it's a very stripped down case. It's very bare bones. It doesn't have all kinds of extraneous information which you have to decide 
where you have to decide which information is relevant and which piece of information is not relevant. Here I've pretty much given you only the stuff that is relevant. Okay. Well, this case is actually written by me, so I, that's why here you see all this, uh, and then it's preceded by a technical note. So you haven't, you are not, have you have, have you done any other case in the past which has a technical note? No, okay. So normally some of these finance cases will have technical notes. The objective in the technical note is to give you the theoretical background that is required to answer the questions in the case. Okay. So what is an underlying position? What is a key risk factor? All these questions you will get to know by reading the how to answer these questions. You apply them to the case, but you read the theory in the technical notes. Okay, there are actually two more technical notes: one on futures, one on swaps. That we'll get to later. First, let's get to the basics of the theory. So this is actually the balance sheet. This uh, case involves a treasurer of. Uh, so the treasurer is the person who actually manages risk for the company. Okay, so uh, the treasurer of, Mac of Magma Resources is a natural resources company. So you look at their balance sheet, you get to see the essentially what you see on the balance sheet are the inventories of their products that they have, and then they have certain loans. Okay. So let's study the balance sheet, then we'll uh, we'll quickly get to the we'll look at the questions, and then we'll start going through them. No, no, this is actually what is called an armchair case. Okay. Most of the cases that you guys have studied. Okay. Maybe you have done a case on Infosys or something. Those are called field cases. So since you are remember when we studied, when we discussed topics like uh, seminar style method of teaching, okay, which you did in say lab. In lab, we followed more of a seminar style method of teaching, okay. Whereas in the case of finance, we are following more of a lecture tutorial method of teaching. Okay, so as students, you have to also know about different methods of learning. So different types of case. We also have different types of cases. Most of the cases that you have done. Are uh, what are called field cases, okay? Like Arvind Mills, you go to Arvind Mills, you go and interview the managers at Arvind Mills, talk to them, okay? And then you write the case, okay? That's a field case. Most of the cases are like that. This, what I have written, is a armchair case. This is called an armchair case. That is, I sit in my armchair and I just manufacture the case. I create the case, okay? It's not based on my business base. The objective of this case essentially is to cover. All the concepts that are required in corporate treasury risk management. Okay, all the concepts of the case are written in such a way that it will bring out all the concepts that you need in treasury risk management. Okay, so this will be useful for your risk management uh, placement interviews. Hopefully, because I, I found that they are actually asking for risk management profile profiles. They are asking other types of questions, but you can tell them about this case. Some of these KPMG and EMY they come for your risk management placements. Okay, so they have these kind of profiles, risk management. So you can apply all the learning from this case in those kind of uh, interviews. Okay, so this is the objective of this case. Is everybody on board so far? Are you following? Yes. Okay. If you have any problem, you have to ask. Those in front just get used to this practice of me being at the back. Okay. We just have to. The objective is to cover the material and make sure you understand the concepts. Okay. So uh, so let's look at the balance sheet. Then you'll get an idea. All right. So this balance sheet is a little bit big. Okay, never mind. We can see the items. All right. So is everyone familiar with what you see here? Okay. Assets. So essentially, again, this is what is called a stylized balance sheet. A stylized balance sheet means every item on the balance sheet is not shown. I have only stripped out certain key factors which I want you to look at. Okay. So this is a very simplified, uh, uh, you know, balance sheet, and you can only see the inventories of various products. And here in column C, you can see. Let's just focus on the asset side first. You can see the so on top of gold, you have the gold price. On top of copper, you have the copper price. Okay, and if you mouse over, you can see the the units of quotation. So this is dollars and cents actually. Okay. So these are actually the starting market prices. So anyway, you can see that they have inventories, the units. So they have uh, ten thousand ounces of gold. So you have, these are troy ounces. Okay. Troy ounces of gold. Their position is ten thousand. Uh, troy ounces of gold, two and a half million pounds of copper. So the copper that we are going to trade, the copper contract that we are going to trade, is high grade copper as traded on the NYMEX, uh, on the COMEX division of uh, the CME Group. Okay. So this because it, their, their unit uh, unit of quotation is basically pounds. All right. So that's two point eight zero means two point two dollars and eighty cents per pound. That's the price of copper. This is how copper is traded in the international markets. There's also a contract in London, which is a different unit of quotation. Okay, but U.S. copper is traded in 
uh, is quoted in cents per pound, in, in dollars and cents per pound. Actually, in cents per pound, but they show it in dollars and cents per pound. The display is in dollars and cents per pound. So this means 2.8 dollars per pound of high-grade copper. Okay, that's what it means. 11.96 price means 11.96 dollars per troy ounce of gold. Okay, and then the last one is you already familiar with this quotation, which is 73.56 dollars per barrel of West Texas. Okay, these are the prices. And on the next column, you can see the amount of inventory that they have. So 10,000 troy ounces, two and a half million pounds, and, and one million barrels of oil. So okay. what is 2.80? 2.80 is the price of copper, which means two dollars eighty cents per pound per pound of copper. <laughs> yeah. So it's a way of writing. I mean, the display, right? So uh, 2.80 is 2.80 dollars per. Uh, pound of copper. That's the price. Okay, these prices are very, very recent. I think two days old, two days old or something like that. Okay. All right. So this gives you, and then you can see the market value because we want to. Another thing to note is this is this is a U.S. dollar balance sheet. So you can see one thing in the case that it says that this company is based in Virginia and their balance sheet is in U.S. Their financials are all in U.S. dollars. Yes. So that is something that is important from a risk management point of view. You need to understand what the what is the balance sheet currency. This point is important. Okay, so here the balance sheet currency is U.S. dollars. Okay, and so we are looking at the U.S. dollar market value of this uh, of the inventories. Okay, uh, and in the individual components as well. Now let's look at the liability shelf side of the balance sheet. You can see that um, they have a loan of one and a half billion yen. Okay, and a twenty million Aussie dollar loan. So this balance sheet is actually very small. Okay, it's a very small balance sheet because I have to. Also, uh, take into account how much because you have only one million dollars in. If you do this project on GWS, the reason this balance sheet is very small is if you do this project on GWS, your starting equity is only one million dollars. Yes, okay, so you need to be able to do a reasonable amount of hedging. So if I make a huge normal balance sheet like a billion dollar balance sheet or something, you will not be able to do much hedging with your GWS account because you have only one million dollars of equity. Okay, so that's why this balance sheet is made as an artificially small balance sheet. In real life, it will be much bigger. Okay, but that doesn't affect your learning. It doesn't affect your logic. The processes that you learn, the methods that you learn, they are not going to be affected by the size of the balance sheet because of the size. Of the actual balance sheet that you encounter in real life, if it's ten times bigger, it's going to change. It's not going to change anything in terms of your thinking process. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Okay. It will not change anything. So we have to make it realistic from a hedging point of view using the software that we are going to use. Okay. So on the liability side, as it says in the note, when you read the case, you'll see the yen loan and the Aussie loan are at fixed rates. Okay. So you have a loan of one and a half billion yen, and uh, you have twenty million dollars, and then you have a dollar loan of fifteen million as well, and the dollar loan is at a floating rate. Okay. So we'll, that will introduce certain complications. And that will require some risk management, so we will discuss that. So this is the setup of the balance sheet. Okay, Rakia. Why should it be one? Okay, okay. No, no. Yeah, you're right. You're right. From a consistency point of view, so that you're very right. Good that you're pointing out factors like that. But here I've just put it because there's no rate to put there. I just put it there so that in case I change the loan amount. I don't have to write the full billion again, so I have made that into a, a data entry cell. Okay. So that you are, but you are very right, very good uh, input that you un, you understood that that rate should be one. Okay, but if I follow the consistency with the dollar yen rate and the Aussie dollar rate, okay. So anyway, so I put it there just uh, it's 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 mainly to save me the trouble of if I want to increase the US dollar loan to twenty billion, I'm not going to write twenty billion. I'll just change that fifty to twenty. Okay, in the in column H. Okay. So what do you see now? Uh, okay. So on in column H, what you can see is the uh, these are the spot rates. Okay. In column H, you have spot rates of dollar yen and Aussie dollars. Okay. These are important. Why we why why are these important? We'll see that. Okay. So here, uh, so yeah, and then obviously just ignore that 15 over there. That's not meant for you. It's just for my convenience. So just look at the Aussie dollar rate and the uh, yen, uh, dollar yen rate. Okay, so uh, this is the situation in this balance sheet. Now you notice that in this sense, the starting balance sheet. Okay, so what is going to happen in your project? Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Is that uh, this is this is a starting balance sheet? So this is obviously a fact. 
uh, uh, you know, the actual value of the balance sheet is a function of the prices that I have put in. If I change the prices, the value of the balance sheet will change. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Everyone follows? Yes. yes. Are you following? Yes. Sir. If I change the price, the value of the balance sheet will change? Yes. Okay, so let's see that once. If I make this, uh, instead of 1196, the price of gold, let me change that to. Say, no, no, let's make it, uh, okay, you want to in, uh, yeah, increase it, let's make it 1600. Hmm. Okay, it is two, two decibels we have. Okay, so can you see that the value, value has changed? Okay, from 92 it has gone to 96 because the value of your inventories has gone up okay because we just increased the gold price the position does not change position has not changed 10,000 you try ounces of gold you still have 10,000 ounces of gold but now suddenly you have uh, the value of the uh, the market price has gone up so the value of the gold position has gone up so obviously the total value of your balance sheet has gone up okay so now notice one more thing sorry that's what so I want you are going too many steps ahead. I was going to just check that. So make sure. Library obviously the assets have gone up, so libraries have to go up. Total libraries have to go up. But notice something that uh, because we are not able to see that in this view, we are not able to see this in this view because I maybe I should increase uh, decrease the view, make it. Okay, now you can see the whole thing. You can still read at the back. Ria, you can read the figures. Okay, so now let's change it back. Now look at the dollar value. Just focus on the dollar value of the loans. I'm just, I'm sure this is basic, basic stuff. But there's 15 million and 14.4 million and 13.2 million here. Okay, we are interested in the dollar values because this is a dollar balance sheet. Is everyone clear? This is a dollar balance sheet. Now I change the gold price back. Okay, from 1600. So and notice the total balance sheet is 96 million. Okay, just rounding out. 97 actually because 96.5 so 97 million balance sheet i'm going to change this back to 1196 now notice what happens to the dollar values of the three loans one minute one minute i'm just making sure that everybody understands this okay this is basic balance sheet but i'm just making sure that because we have checked before and seen that many of you don't remember your basic concepts is there any change in the total balance sheet Yes, 96 to 92, 97 to 92 or 93, okay? But is there any change in the loans? Is there any change in the loan values? No change in the loan values, right? Because your loan liabilities do not change, okay? Let's say the dollar value of your loans, okay? We are looking only at the dollar value to standardize it. The dollar value of your loans has not changed. Is there any change in the net worth? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's a change in the net worth, right? The net worth has gone from 53 to 49. 53 to 49 or 40, uh, 50, okay, 54 or whatever it was to 40, uh, 250. Yes, so is this clear to everybody how the system works? Okay, that means, so here we have seen that we have seen both sides. First we increased the price of gold and we saw that the net worth went up. Is everyone following this point? I'm not looking at the individual faces, but I hope everybody understood this logic, right? That uh, Shushant, you're following? Yes, sir. That if we change the value of the assets, change the price of the asset, change the value of the asset, there is no change in the value of the loans. Is this clear to everybody? Okay, so what is changing is the net worth figure. Everyone is clear that net worth is a residual number. Okay, if you check the, if you check the formula, you'll see that, I don't know where I put the formula. This is where I put the formula. Okay, you can see the formula is, the total balance sheet minus, okay, this is very basic stuff, but I'm making sure that everybody understands this clearly. The, it's total balance sheet minus all the other li outside liabilities, okay? The loans are your outside liabilities and this is the, the residual is the net worth, okay? So whenever there's a balance, so when the balance sheet value went up, so when the balance sheet value went up, the benefit went to the net worth. When the balance sheet value went down, Again, the uh, the detriment will also go to the net worth. Okay, so the net worth is the residual. It takes all the the hits and the misses. Okay, 
So, so this is what you have to understand. This is basically what's going to happen, and this is why there is risk to be managed. The moment you have a balance sheet like this, okay, we have, um, and you only see the asset side because there can be this kind of effect can also come from the liability side. Uh, on the, uh, if you look at the two exchange rates when we look at them, okay, if those change, that will also change the value of your uh, your net worth figure. Okay, so there is risk on this balance sheet from multiple factors, but one thing you have clearly seen that there is risk from the gold price. Okay, there is a benefit also, and then there is a risk as well. Okay. You saw that the gold price went up from 1196 to 1600 and your net worth went down. But if the gold price falls from 1600 to 1196, then your net worth goes down. So there is a risk there to be managed. Okay, if you just close your eyes and go to sleep, then it might, against, it might go against you. So you have to watch it. Is this clear to everybody? That there is risk here? Okay, so let's try to understand this now. So essentially there is also risk. It's a little bit more complicated, so we'll, we'll see this when we come to the, when we return to the uh, the exchange rates, the consideration of the exchange rates. Okay, so let's go back to the theory now and quickly cover the theory. Okay, but let's read the three questions. So these are the first three questions you want to answer. Key risk factors. What are the key risk factors? This is how you have to proceed with the analysis of a balance sheet. When you are working for a corporate treasury, you have to analyze and you're trying to do risk management for a corporate treasury. First, you have to analyze the balance sheet, even for a bank trading book. Even for a bank trading book, uh, speculative trading book, it's the same analysis. You still have to look at what are the key risk factors, okay? You have to be clear about what are the underlying positions for each uh, KRF market, okay? And then you have to sort of we look at the decision problems, okay? That's a little bit more theoretical, the third part, but we'll see about that, okay? So let's go to this technical note, okay, on risk management. All right, so here you'll notice that there are many terms which have already been covered, but because I've written this as a case and the technical law has to be comprehensive, okay? So I have added all these terms like base asset because this is all stuff that needs to be covered. So I've added this. So what you can do is when you're, if you're clear about transaction date, settlement date, just skip those sections, okay? Just go to the new sections, but the technical law has to be written in a comprehensive way to cover all the concepts that are required to answer the questions. That's why all these ideas are also in the technical note. So it's duplication for, for you guys, for some of the topics. So just ignore the new, uh, just ignore the old topics. Go to the, what you need first is. Only two to three topics are new. Rest all new. Yeah, the rest are all new. And in fact, not only that, under position exposure also, there are certain new topics yes, you have to be aware of. So make sure you go through, skim through everything and see that there is no position exposure you already know, okay? The way to look at a position is basically, the idea that it's a bet when you're long you're betting that the bet uh, asset price will rise okay when you're short you're betting that the asset price will fall okay this is the correct way to look at it so long short okay we've got this okay this is one point that you have to be aware of outright positions versus spread and differential positions okay try to understand this point actually we don't need this point for our KRF for the first three questions. Um, this is actually, uh, let's do one thing. Let's come back to this a little bit later because we don't need this point. But I want to get you guys started off, okay? So that we can start. Okay, let's cover it anyway. Let's start uh, cover it because we have. Uh, So the first question, we are adding to your understanding of positions and exposures, okay? We are adding a concept of outright position versus spread or differential positions, okay? So OP versus SP. So we are just going to use OP and SP for, for the sake of brevity, okay? So essentially outright prices are all that you see here. If you see on that screen here, you can see all these foreign exchange prices, Euro dollar, Bitcoin dollar, okay? Uh, Sterling, uh, that's cable, dollar yen, uh, dollar Canada, dollar Swiss, all these prices that you see, these are all outright outright positions. Okay, if you have a position in any of these markets, you have an outright position. If you're long dollar yen, okay, if you're long, a short dollar Swiss, these are all outright positions. Okay, essentially, if you see here, because this idea behind an outright position is that you have, if you look at this also, here we have zero positions, but let's say if I buy some euros, okay. Yes, I'm just going to make 
for I don't want to just make it okay there's some problem with this account so anyway I can't enter new new positions on this account for I don't know what the reason is anyway never mind we can enter it on this so here if I okay so here if I just see I'm already actually I don't need to do this because I already have a position can you see this that I'm short 20k on the euro can you see that the position is there on this in this column here in the euro on the euro row if you see the euro row under the position column under the position column can you see that there's minus 20k you see that this means I have a position in the euro I'm short 20k in the euro okay so this is an example of an outright position mainly because this market trades directly and you can't further break down this position okay you can't further break down this why it says in here it's an atomic level position in the sense that okay so an atomic level market price means this is a market price that is trading directly atomic level means essentially what this means of course now we have quantum physics so we have the physics of somewhat subatomic particles but we are just ignoring that this expression has remained in the language when we say an atomic level category means that category can't be broken down further okay it can't be broken down further so that's why it's for an atomic level price so essentially just uh, get used to this I, these are the markets which trade directly okay and you have this uh, kind of an atomic level uh, market price so you can't further break it down it will become clearer when you look at what is an outer, uh, what is the spread position okay so you have all these markets dollar yen euro oil wheat gold anything that you look at any market that you look at these are most of these major markets these are all uh, if you have positions in these markets these are all outright positions so you can say that they do not have any flexible property sorry we can also say that they do not have any flexible property they are talking no 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 don't bring in fractals into this fractals is a different matter which we use fractal essentially means the same pattern oh. appearing on multiple levels okay so I, I understand why you might be asking that question but don't bring that idea into this it's not related to this it will create confusion so it is just a market where any market most of the markets that you follow most of the major markets that you follow these are all atomic uh, these are all uh, atomic level prices and these are outright positions if you are long dollar yen short dollar uh, short dollar canada these are all outright positions the more interesting type of position is a spread position okay okay so here look at uh, so look at the essentially the idea behind the outright position is that you concentrate in the you concentrate on the primary market for that particular asset okay the primary market for price discovery if you look at uh, one example uh, if you take this The idea is that most of the outright positions are in what we would consider to be the primary market for price discovery for that particular uh, base asset. Okay, Rem you remember the expression price discovery? Price discovery is the process by which you are setting the price continuously in the market. Okay, through the interaction of price uh, of supply and demand. Okay, so that is price discovery. So in every market, there is in every for every base asset, there is something called a primary market for price discovery and let me explain what I mean by that okay okay look at this now everyone can see the prices one minute I'm just coming here. one second everyone can see the prices now for gold okay now here what we mean by the primary market for price discovery understand this that globally okay the globally uh, the primary market for price discovery in gold okay where is the gold price primarily set in world markets it is set on uh, on a, in the in the us dollar gold market okay so where the us where, where the us dollar is the top asset okay so if you go to a major league gold market maker like mokada goldsmith or you know barclays or some of these companies they, and if you ask them for a gold price in yen, 
they will still quote you a gold price in yen. Okay, but that's not the primary market. So if you want, if you want the uh, the best price, if you want the best price, the most efficient price, and you want the most liquidity, if you are trading a large amount of gold, okay, let's put it this way: if you are trading a large amount of gold, let's say you are the Bank of Japan, and you want to sell a large amount of gold, okay, you would not go to somebody and ask for a gold price in yen. You would go and sell it in the U.S. dollar gold market, and later on you would use the foreign exchange market to convert that gold dollars into yen. Okay, so try to understand from this what is meant by so. Here you have to understand this is a matter of contextual knowledge. You have to be aware if you are operating in the gold market, you need to be aware that the primary market for price discovery in gold is not India. Like here we quote in terms of 10 gram rupees per 10, you know, rupees per 10 gram. This is not how the international gold price is set. That's why. Which is a tragedy that despite India being such a big consumer of gold, okay, we are either number one or number two, okay. Uh, but we still don't, we still don't determine the international price of gold because we don't have a convertible mark, we don't have a convertible currency, our capital markets are not open. So the international gold price continues to be set in U.S. dollar terms in the OTC spot markets for precious metals, which operate round the clock, but the main market is in London. So is this clear to everybody? To understand the gold market is a very important market. Through this, we can understand the concept of in every kind of for every base asset, there will be a market which is the primary market for price discovery. So, in gold, the primary market for price discovery, where the international gold price is set, it's not in India. Okay, it is in the international OTC spot markets for gold, where gold is traded as US in terms of US dollars per troy ounce. Okay, not in terms of 10 grams and all that. This is clear, to everybody. This is that's why we say that in gold. The primary market for price discovery is the gold in terms of the international spot market where gold is traded in terms of US dollars per troy ounce. Okay. So what I'm trying to show you here is that if the Bank of Japan wanted to sell, let's say, a large amount of gold, okay, and then the primary market for price discovery is where the maximum liquidity is. Okay, that's where the maximum liquidity is. Okay. So if the Bank of Japan wanted to sell a large amount of gold and they wanted to get yen in return for that, okay. So they would be foolish to go and ask for a price directly in terms of gold and yen, because that market is not liquid. Okay, that market is not liquid. The right way to operate in that kind of situation is for the Bank of Japan to go and sell gold in the international spot market against U.S. dollars, and then in step two, you sell those dollars in the dollar yen spot market. You can see here again on thirteen eighty three. Okay, in the dollar yen spot market. Then you go and sell those dollars. First, you sell the gold against US dollars. Then you take those US dollars and then you go to the OTC spot market for dollar yen, and then you sell the dollars against that and dollars in that market, and you get the yen. So eventually, you have got rid of your gold and got the yen. Is everyone clear about this? So this is how you have to operate in markets. Okay. So that's why we would say that gold in terms of yen. If you have a gold position in yen, that's actually like an that's actually like a spread position. Okay. That's actually like a spread position because this position can be further decomposed, okay, and should be further decomposed. A gold position, if you are long gold and short yen, if you are long gold and short yen, what we would actually say is that you are long in the gold market against U.S. dollars, okay, and uh, you are long in the gold market. See, think of this. Uh, I don't know how. To, let's do it on the spreadsheet so it gets captured on the video. Is everyone clear about what I said? Are you following? That is why gold, gold in terms of U.S. dollars is the primary market for price discovery. So the atomic level market, the outright position would be in a in the gold versus U.S. dollars position. If you have a position there, it's an outright position. But if you are long gold and short yen, okay, this is not an outright position. This is actually should be treated as a spread position because this position can and should be decomposed into two positions: long gold and short U.S. dollars in the gold market. In the primary gold market, you are long gold and short US dollars, and in the spot dollar yen market, you are long dollars and short yen. Yes, sir. Is so this also requires some knowledge of uh, what in every asset class or every asset, uh, what is the primary market for price discovery? Okay, you have to be clear about this. Okay, so we have already discussed that point, so you understood the gold in. Uh, so this is what this means. Sir? Yeah. I was going through the notes. So, can you tell a major difference? One major difference between what the difference between futures and forwards? Futures and forwards we have already discussed. I mean, uh, Sir, okay, it's not one minute, one minute. It's not connected to this topic we are discussing. But I'll tell you briefly. 
futures are exchange traded products and forwards are OTC products. Okay. Otherwise, they are economically very similar. Okay. Economically, they are almost the same. But futures are exchange traded and forwards are OTC. So now what you can do is immediately recall all the differences between OTC markets and exchange traded markets. And then all of those exchange traded ET market properties you can apply to futures. And all the OTC properties you can apply to forwards. Yes, sir. Is this is clear. Only the differences of the market, nothing else. No, yeah, but because of the market, it, there, there are certain cash flow differences. There is a cash flow difference involved. Broadly speaking, if you want to understand, Tanuja's uh, question is not related to what we are studying directly, but essentially this is the answer to this question. Okay. And the other thing is essentially that because it's an exchange traded product, futures they will be daily cash flows. Even if you have sold a futures contract which is let's say three months forward, there will be daily cash flows because every day there is a settlement of profits and losses and in the case of forwards there is only one cash flow at the end if you do a three month forward contract because in forwards there is no daily so OTC market so therefore there will be only one cash flow at the end that's a, now again we are going into more complicated matters options are very different from futures okay so we won't go into that now because we are studying a different topic okay but okay so for futures uh, let's look at this so spread position now let's look at another example of a spread position which is uh, we're putting a lot of material here we no we just say that those are just uh, that's the instrument remains the same like if we say that the primary market for price discovery, okay, so we should use the expression primary market for price discovery, okay. Uh, so in that is spot gold, okay. So the spot market, the OTC spot market for gold, okay. So that means the instrument remains spot. So there is no change in the instrument as such. The character of the instrument does not change. Okay, I'm just getting a little nervous because I put in so much material here and it's not directly, I wanted to get you started on the case. Anyway, let's cover this. So this example is already mentioned here, okay. Okay, let me do one thing here. Okay, if uh, to understand the spread position, we have just gone to the discussion of basis risk. Okay, so here you can see a chart of uh, crude oil versus jet fuel prices. Okay, the so jet fuel price is higher because the jet fuel is a downstream product. It is like kerosene. It's a downstream product, so the refinery will take in crude oil and process it through the distillation process, and then one of the outputs that will come out is kerosene uh, is jet fuel. Okay, and that's what you have to use in the aircraft. All right. So it's called a jet fuel is called ATF. You might have heard discussions about ATF taxes in India being very high. Okay, so the uh, ATF is aviation turbine fuel. The name is aviation turbine fuel. That's why it's called ATF. But the other name is the jet is jet fuel. So it is high, higher than the crude oil price. So can you see that? Do they move more or less together? Yes, sir. They move more or less together, right? Okay, but they're not exactly the same because you can see the differences going. Sometimes it's wider. Sometimes it's narrower. Can you see that? So there are two things to note here. One is that jet fuel prices are higher because it's a downstream product. Okay, so you have the cost of the raw material plus the processing uh, costs. So uh, the second is that they move more or less together. And the third is that, but they still don't move exactly together. Sometimes the spread is wide, sometimes it's narrow. Okay, so you can't just assume that they're always going to be moving at once. As exact difference. There won't be an exact difference between the two all the time. Okay. So this is what is happening. See. So what happens is now if you think of an airline, okay. So airline is basically airline is going to be affected. What will be will it be good for the airline? If uh, oil, so, another thing to note here obviously is that when oil prices go up, jet fuel prices will have to go up because the raw material is going up. Is this clear? So when oil prices go up, jet fuel prices will have to go up, okay? Because the processing cost will never be negative, okay? So therefore, so that is one uh, thing. So one, what happens is, so an airline for, so, so think of it from an airline's perspective. Okay, 
let's say Singapore Airlines, now they're flying so many uh, routes, okay? So if jet fuel prices keep on going up, is it good for the airline or bad? Bad, bad. bad for the airline, okay. So one of the things that the airline can do is, the airline can uh, hedge itself by buying crude oil futures. Okay, one option that is there the, for, the jet, uh, for the airline, okay? So in this case, what the airline has, so, so the first thing we say is that because if jet fuel prices go up, then it's bad for the airline, okay? So then, and if jet fuel prices fall, is it good for the airline? It's good for the airline? Okay. So let's actually, we can use this concept here itself to understand the, one of the important concepts, which is the concept of your underlying position, okay? We can use this chart itself to introduce the idea, okay? Uh, who switched off the fan? We all switched off the fan. Okay. All right. Anyway, so uh, the I'll try to uh, use this concept. So we have already understood that the when jet fuel prices go up, it's bad for the airline, and when prices fall, jet fuel prices fall, then it's good for the airline. Okay. So now tell me, what is the what is the airline's underlying position with respect to jet fuel? Okay. It's a new term that we are understand that we are introducing underlying position. So or uh, just forget about the underlying. Just talk about the positions. What is the what is the airline's position with respect to jet fuel? Is it long or short? Remember, positions can only be either long and short. So if you're if you're square, then you don't have a position. Okay? So position is either long or short. So jet fuel uh, airline position is you're saying most of you are saying long. Some are saying short. Okay. Now one sec. Let's answer this question. So Gaba is saying short, and the rest of you are saying most of you are saying long. Okay. It's a question. Now you're saying short. <laughs> okay, I thought you said initially you said long. Okay, so is the question clear to everybody? Okay, we know what happens to the airline if the jet fuel price goes up, it's bad for them. If it goes down, it's good for them. Okay, now the question I'm asking you is if this, if you know this, if you have this information that price going up is bad, price going up down is good. Okay, now I'm asking you a second question. Uh, then tell me what is the position. Now think about it logically. You guys have already traded. If if your if the situation is such, if the situation is such that if the price goes up, it's good, it's bad for you, and if the price goes down, it's good for you. That's what we saw in the case of airlines. We saw that if the price goes up, we are discussing jet fuel positions. Okay. So in, with respect to jet fuel positions, we see that. Uh, on that question, we see that if jet fuel prices go up, it's bad for the airline, and if it goes down, it's good for the airline. Is this clear? Okay. So now tell me if this is the situation that if price going up is bad, price going down is good, then what is the jet? What is the airline's position with respect to jet fuel? Short. 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 Right. I know that you have a position, but I don't know what your position is. Okay. So I know that you have a position, but I don't know what your position is. But I have this information that when the price goes up. The, when that market, whatever the market is that in which you have the position, okay? I know that when that market price goes up, it's bad for you. And when that market price goes down, it's good for you. So from this, I can conclude that your position must be short. Because a long position will not behave like this. Only a short position behaves like this. That if it goes up, it's bad for you. It goes down, the market price goes down, it's good for you. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. So from this, we have actually learned the idea of uh, the Underlying position. Okay, so here we say we introduce another term. We say underlying position. Okay, so we say that for the case of an airline, okay, take that as an example. We say that the to understand the concept of underlying position, we say that in the case of an airline, its underlying position with respect to jet fuel or its underlying position in the jet fuel market, okay, is what is it? Short or long? Short. Short. Okay. So the airline is short jet fuel. Okay. Their underlying position is short jet fuel. Is this clear? Okay. Why is it not clear? The airlines always require fuel. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so they should be long on fuel. No, no. They first. Okay. So that's why. Okay. One minute. I understand what you're saying. Okay. So that is one. That is the. You're looking at the inventory. Yes. We are looking at the inventory of jet fuel. We are not looking at the inventory. We are looking at the economic Point exposure. Point of okay. So it's a good. I understand why you asked the question. So actually, Sahil is saying that since they are always buying jet fuel. Okay, because they have to fuel the planes. So if you look at the inventory, it will always be long jet fuel. Okay, but here when I'm saying uh, it's, it's an understandable question, but the concept we are discussing called underlying position is your underlying exposure. Okay, and that's why we say underlying, which is like a core concept. Underlying means it's kind of a core exposure. Okay, your underlying position. Okay, which is what is your natural position in the particular market. 
Okay. If you did not buy any jet fuel, your natural position is short because if the price goes up, the implication for you is negative. If the price goes down, your implication for you is positive. Okay. Yeah, without doing anything. Without doing anything, think about the natural position of the airline. What will happen to them? If the, like just say, if you look at the airline price stocks, if you look at airline stocks and if you assume that they can't pass on any uh, cost price, cost increases, then uh, in that case, if air crude prices go up, airline stocks should fall. Yes, sir. Okay? So, is, why is that falling? Because their earning projection will go down, because their margins will fall, because we are assuming that they can't pass on any of the cost increases. So, they have to absorb the cost increase, so the margins will fall, so the profits will fall, so the price stock price will fall. Okay? So, it is bad for the airline in, the, in that sense. The prices go up. Okay, I understand your question. The inventory, don't look at the inventory. When we are talking about underlying position, we are talking about something like a natural position. Okay, is this clear? Like a natural position. Okay, so if you think of it from India's point of view now, again, if you look at the Indian point of view, what is, let's take a related question, what is India's position with, what is India's underlying position with respect to crude oil? Are we long or short? Short, oh, short, short. We are short crude oil because if crude oil prices go up, it is bad for us because we are a net importer. Okay, so therefore again, so it's like, are you getting the sense of what is meant by underlying position? Okay, it's a natural, uh, it's natural to be confused with the inventories, but I'm saying put that aside. Think about the natural underlying position. That's why we say underlying position. Okay, the natural position. So for India, the natural position is we are short crude oil. So Saudi Arabia is. Long, long crude oil. Norway is long crude oil. US, okay. long. US is also long crude oil now, okay, because they are becoming an exporter, the biggest producer of oil and gas now. Okay. So this is the situation. This is how you to understand the concept of underlying position. Okay. Is this clear? Okay, so the long side we are not discussing. Now what happens is so the underlying position of an airline is uh, short jet fuel. Okay. So what they might do is they might actually hedge themselves. By buying, and we notice that uh, if you are the CFO of an airline, you see that uh, crude oil prices and jet fuel prices move quite uh, I mean more or less together. Okay, not exactly, but more or less together. Okay, and there is a very liquid market for crude oil futures, very liquid market, but there isn't much of a market. Let's say assume that there isn't ac actually any market. Okay, for jet fuel, there is a market, but it's a physical market essentially, and it's not that liquid, not not as good as the uh, crude oil price. Uh, so, what you do as a treasurer of, of, a, of, a, of a CFO of an airline is you are short jet fuel. You are short jet fuel. You know your position is short jet fuel. What you do as a hedge is you buy crude oil futures. Is this clear? You buy crude oil futures. Yes. Yeah. So your underlying, the underlying position of the airline is short. Okay. So they want, so if they do nothing, think of it this way. If the airline does nothing, the underlying position does not change. It remains short. So if an airline does not do any proactive hedging, and they're seeing, as you can see now, crude oil prices have been moving up quite dramatically, okay? So those airlines which have not proactively hedged their exposures to crude oil, to jet fuel, okay? They are seeing their costs going up. Okay, now whether or not you can actually pass on the cost increases to the customer is a function of competitive dynamics in the market. If you're the only guy raising prices, then nobody's going to fly with you. You'll be the last choice yes. for flying, right? Customers will all go to the other airlines. Okay, so uh, that means you'll be in trouble. So your natural position, your underlying position is short. So if you want to hedge it, you will hedge it by, by because you want to now what you want to do in a hedge. Okay, this also gives you the idea of hedging. If you want to, uh, what you want to do in a hedge is, you want to do something which will, which will offset what will happen to you in the underlying position. So the idea of hedging is that the hedge position should offset the, all this is something in your notes, so if you want to take notes, then just try to understand it. That the hedge position, when you are trying to hedge your underlying exposure, okay, you have to, if you do nothing, you will be in trouble, you could be in trouble, okay. So in, when you want to hedge, what you have to do is you have to do something which will, uh, be the opposite of your underlying position. You have to create a position which is the opposite of your underlying position. So that when the underlying position is losing money, the hedge position should make money. Are you following the logic? Okay. Yeah. So this is an important concept. So we, we, let's make sure we understand it properly. So you understand the need to hedge. First, is everybody clear about underlying position and the need to hedge? Because we have shorting the spot market. 
Yeah, you can say you are short in the spot market. You can say that on a continuous basis you will need to buy. So if prices go up, it's bad for you. So your underlying position, you can say, is continuously spot, short in the spot market. Okay. All right. Is this clear to everyone? So underlying position is clear. So the underlying position arises from the nature of the business. Okay. All right. So now, if obviously one of the problems is if you do not do anything, you could be in trouble. All right. So you have to do something. Now, when you do something, that's your hedging program. Okay. Then you run a hedging program. So what you want to do, obviously, is common sense. Your underlying, you can't really change your underlying position. If you are an airline, you are always going to be natural. Your natural position is short jet fuel. Okay. You can't change that uh, factor. You can't change that reality. What you can change is you can set up a separate hedge position so that it behaves in the opposite manner to your underlying position. So if the underlying position is losing money, the hedge position should make money so that it will offset the underlying position. Okay, and then it will. Uh, so on balance, you'll be okay. Are you following? Okay, so you are not clear 100%. See, so you, you have an underlying position. Okay, so an underlying position will behave in a particular way. When prices go up, it will lose money, and when uh, prices go down, it will make money. So if you do nothing, you might actually lose money because prices will go up. Prices might go up. So you want to do something which is you want to set up a hedge position. A hedge position is the best way to think about a hedge position is a, it's an offset. It is meant to offset the others uh, what is happening on the other side. So you have to set up an offset. You understand what is offset? Opposite. Okay. You have to do something opposite so that uh, you have to create an opposite position. You have an underlying position. You can't change that. As long as you are going to be in the airline business, you will be short jet fuel. Period. There's nothing to discuss, or you don't have to do anything. Anyway, you are naturally short jet fuel if you are in the airline business. Is this clear? So if you just sit passively and do nothing, you could end up losing a lot of money. So what you want to do is set up a hedge position which is like an offset. So it should be the opposite of your underlying position. So that when the underlying position loses money, the hedge position should be making money. Okay, so that then you have an offset and on balance you are okay. The sum of the two, you are okay. Yes. Is this clear to everybody? Yes, what is the idea behind hedging? So first you have to understand the natural position on the underlying position and then you will see or figure out whether it is long or short and then in the hedge position the idea is you do the opposite. You create an opposite position so it acts as an offset. Okay. So is everyone clear about this so far? Yes. So if the market is moving in a favorable direction, then we will do anything. No, see, this is a because see, at a point of time, you don't know which way the market will go. This is a problem in the future, right? You don't know which way it's going to go. So, if you want to be careful, the other thing about hedging, when we come to the technical definition of hedging, remember what we did, what we discussed, reduction of risk. Reduction of risk. So, the objective of hedging, the objective of hedging is to reduce uncertainty. Okay, the objective of hedging is to reduce, reduce uncertainty, and that's why. You, that is that is the main objective behind the hedging program. Okay, so that's why you try to reduce the uncertainty and reduce the risk. So it could happen. I understand what you're getting at. So what you're saying, I think what Billy is getting at is that if an airline, okay, first your question is a little bit ahead. Let's cover some of the other concepts. Okay, other steps. Okay, so first we understand natural position is short jet fuel. If you are in the airline business, you are short jet fuel. Nothing you can do about it. What you can do about it is you set up a hedge position which is an offset to the underlying position so it will behave in the opposite manner okay so what do you do you buy crude oil futures now if you buy crude oil futures okay uh, obviously when crude oil prices go up what will happen to your position you make money or lose money you make money okay because if you're buying crude oil futures and crude oil futures go up after that you're making money Okay. Now we also see that when crude oil futures, crude oil prices go up, what happens to jet fuel prices? They also go up. Okay. So your underlying position is losing money on the jet because of the jet fuel price increase, but your hedge position is making money because you bought crude oil futures. Okay. So that's why this one is offsetting the other. Is this clear? So that on on balance you're okay. Okay. So this is the idea behind hedging. The reason you do it is you want to reduce uncertainty. You don't know what will happen in the future. It could also go down. Okay, right? Oil prices overall could go down, but uh, it could also go up because you don't know what will happen. You want to reduce uncertainty. Okay, yeah. The amount of money the underlying position will make. 
and the amount of money the hedging position will lose, yeah. will be same. Yeah. Now that is, is Karoj's question is whether the amount of money that is lost or made on the underlying position should be exactly equal to the, uh, let's reverse it, the amount, should you set up your hedge position in such a way that the amount of money you are losing on the underlying position is exactly equal to the amount you make or, make or lose on the hedge position, one minute, let me just answer that, let me just answer that. That is one of the options. You can decide the size of your hedge position. So if you do what he is suggesting or what he is asking about that, you set up the hedge position in such a way that the amount of money you will lose on the hedge position will be exactly equal to the amount of money you make on the underlying position or vice versa. If you want to do it that way, that is called a 100% hedge. That means you have hedged 100% of, uh, of your exposure. Yes. You can also decide not to hedge 100%, you can decide to hedge 25%, 35%, whatever you want to do. That's a matter of judgment. Okay? But you can also, that's one of the options, the 100% hedge. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Your question is not imp uh, improper. I'm just saying the question, the answer to your question is that that is one of the options. You don't have to do it that way. Any percentage of the amount we can Any percentage. Okay, so that is decided by your heading risk management policy. So every company should have a risk management policy where they lay out uh, the plan that we will hedge only 25 percent or we will hedge only 50 percent. And this, so this is all something that the company can decide at its discretion. Okay. Okay, is everyone clear about this? Okay, what is your question? Sir, what is the benefit of doing 100% hedging? 100% hedging, the benefit is, what did we say, the objective of hedging is reduction of risk, reduction of risk means uncertainty, okay? So the reduction of risk, hedges always reduce risk, okay? So 100% hedging, the advantage is, you can just go on holiday now, you have nothing to worry about, all hedged. So as essentially at that price level at which you have hedged, you have locked in your entire purchase. Let's say that, let's say the spread for the sake of argument, okay? Let's say that the spread between jet fuel is always going to be constant at $5, okay? $5 above the crude oil price. And let's say you have hedged your entire production, uh, entire consumption for the next five years, okay? At say $75 a barrel, assuming that you got that price for five years, okay? So that means essentially that you have bought crude oil futures at $75 for the next five years, okay? A simplistic example. And we have assumed that the markup is only five dollars between the two. Okay, so that means eighty dollars for your jet fuel prices. Okay, so you have locked in your purchase price of jet fuel at eighty dollars for the next five years. Hundred percent of your the projected consumption. Okay, so now you have full certainty. Okay, but obviously the problem here is that if what this is what Giri was talking about. Okay, don't get restless because I have an alarm for twelve forty-five. So don't get restless. I don't know why people are getting restless. There's an alarm when it goes off. This is the problem. Why is my battery running low? So because you are tired. Not because I am tired. The battery is tired. Okay. So the time for uh, one minute. So there is a. It's a little risky to keep my laptop on with the. Uh, but anyway, let's quickly finish it off. So um, I should get my. Uh, okay. So is everyone clear about this idea? We have covered a few of the topics. Okay that underlying position also, what Giri was talking about, what Giri was talking about is that he's talking about the part where, let's say an airline has an underlying exposure of short jet fuel, okay, then they buy crude oil futures to hedge 100% of the exposure, and now then crude oil, now crude oil prices collapse. After they have hedged, then crude oil prices collapse, okay, then you can't get any of the benefit of that collapse, because you've already hedged, you're locked in, okay, that means essentially the example that we gave you, $50, uh, $80 for barrel for the next five years. You have hedged your entire projected consumption. Now for the next five years, your input cost is going to be $80 per barrel. Even if oil prices, crude oil oil prices fall to $55, you will not get any of that benefit. Okay? If you want to, you will have to sell your futures hedge position at a loss. Okay? But it doesn't really, economically there is no difference. Okay? So essentially you can't get the benefit. So that is one of the downsides of hedging, okay? That if the price moves in the other direction, then you might, you will not get the benefit. Okay, so if an, from an industry perspective, what happens is, if one airline has hedged 100%, and no other airline has hedged, okay? So what will happen is, if the crude oil price collapses, think about the dynamics here, then your, let's say only Indigo has hedged, and all the other airlines have, none of them have hedged, then crude oil prices collapse. So all these guys, Jet Airways and uh, you know, Vistara and all these people, they would be offering heavily discounted fares 
and Indigo will have to stay at high prices if they want to remain profitable. So this is one of the problems, okay, of hedging. But the reason you do it is again the objective of hedging is not to make money. The objective of hedging is to reduce risk and uncertainty. So the moment you are able to lock in a price, okay, no matter what happens to the price, you are locked in at $80. If you are able to lock in, you have achieved your objective of reduction of risk and uncertainty. Okay, so this is the point that we have to understand with respect to. Sir, but if we come to the sales point again, that yeah. the companies make fuel data, so how will they make the contract? Or the Sorry, come again. Come again. One minute. Okay, I have to shut down this computer because. Okay,